here he comes. Mark, how are you? Hey, listen, firstly, thanks for, uh, for jumping on. I watched your video 10 minutes after the RBA announcement. And for a guy that's not in real estate, you've got your finger on I mean, don't get me wrong, you're in the world of uh, uh, financial services, uh, mortgage broking, and you've got a lot of our real estate community that follow you, but you are spot on with feeling the pulse and temperature of, of that decision. And I actually agree with you. I actually think, I actually, the reason why I think you are right about the tipping point, Mark, is in the last couple of weeks, just the auctions that I've been doing, I've had a lot of vendors say, you know what, like, you know, if if they if they if they don't raise them anymore, we we can learn to live with it, right? But if that happens anymore, we have to make plans because I wasn't aware, Mark. Even though rates are so low, I've never sat down and worked out how loan repayments work. But some of the people's loan repayments, as they come off, yeah, doubling, from and an actual fact, variable, in our in the history in Australia's economic history, uh, more since recorded history, we've never seen. Um, even though interest rates aren't 18 percent like they were in the late 80s and 90s but we've never seen such a high proportion of net income of a person's net income being allocated towards a mortgage this is the highest percentage of the average australian's net income that's going to pay the bank ever in our history and that's largely because of obviously interest rates are fairly high at the moment but largely it's because we borrowed more money um, than we've ever done before. So that that's the biggest issue. And there's in some places they are paying up to 50% of their household income is being spent on a mortgage. Normally 30% is fairly comfortable, comfortable, but 50% nah. So, 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 Mark, here's the interesting thing. So when I go through and I look at the impact that it's got on different, 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 different segments of people, um, the only people that seem to be unaffected by all of this is people who circumstances in life, whether they created them or they, you know, they just fell into them, have got zero debt, are asset rich, um, uh, don't care whether rates go to 20%. Um, their lives are, are indifferent, and that's the, the wealthiest uh, cohort of people in our in, in, in the Australian society. But when you go through the rest of the people, when you when you talk about Ahmed and Sarah who live in punch bowl with a two bedroom unit, when you go through to a tenant who whose rent is going up not by twenty dollars a week, it's going up three hundred bucks a week. Some of these these rents. Then you then you look then you look so you look at tenants, you look at you look at um, you look at buyers, business people that have got, you know, they're the ones that we often don't look at. Because when we think of mortgages, we keep thinking of people with correct. houses. And where, houses where, but where, businesses where, have got mortgages therefore the obvious and, question and, is, and debt, correct? Where, is, where are these organisations and or individuals, who are they that can afford to buy property and pay overs at the moment? Or, and, and where are the businesses that are creating this so-called inflation? Because if what you and I are saying is correct, most people are tightening their belts and have been tightening their belts now for a long time. So the consumers are not going out there and saying, yeah, I want to, I want to pay more for that plumber. I want, I'm, I'm, you know, that plumber's, that electrician's hundred bucks now. I want him for $110 now. Well, they're not going to the coffee shop saying, listen, I don't want to pay $3.50 anymore. I want to pay you $4.50 for that coffee because I want that coffee now. The consumers don't do that. It's the vendors who do that. The vendors ask for more money. So you've got to ask, start asking yourself the question, which vendors are charging more money for goods and services. And the Reserve Bank Governor said today, it's not really about goods that are going up in price, it's services that are going up in price. One of which, in the basket of services that they they choose, they choose rents. Rent is a, rent is a service. So we all know the rents are going up. And you know, for the obvious reason, because the governments haven't allowed us to develop any more property for a long, long time. No DA has been approved for increase in density pretty much anywhere. They blame COVID for a while because now we've got to work to do you know, and to make the approvals. But if you look at applications, new applications for you know developments, they're way down on the toilet, way down on the toilet. So it's no surprise that um, you know rents have gone up, and there's no surprise rents have gone up because we've just let you know we're we're bringing in a, a more than half a million more people to Australia, and we've got to live somewhere. That there's no surprise for any of that. So then, who are the vendors? 
Well, the service vendors, uh, the people that are providing services, are generally speaking, to some extent, tradies. Um, you know, which I'm very happy the tradies make as much money as they can. But we don't have enough tradespeople. We don't have enough people plying their trade. We haven't had enough government support to help the tradies out to, so that we can encourage more kids to become tradespeople. And so we've got a, a greater supply of tradespeople. Because right now, you try to get something done. Try and get a locksmith to come and change the lock. <laughs> Mate, you're waiting forever. Try and get a... And I, you, you and I both have a property in a certain part of Australia. Mm. And uh, I had to get one of my cars uh, fixed. It seemed like no big deal. The motor mechanics, sorry, Mark, can't do it to mid-July. This is like beginning of June, for God's sake. So we need more people. Again, this is goes back to government policy, Tommy. And the government policy, both at council, state and federal, is not enough, not good enough, and is inadequate. Then the final piece to all this, big business, CNC making massive profits, all the retailers, massive profits. You've got to ask yourself this question. How is it that they have so much control that they can pretty much put up their price wherever they want? Now, I'm going to give you one example. I'm a farmer. Three years ago, I had to restock my farm with cattle. I went to the cattle sales and I paid $6.50 for, to buy a young, young cattle. $6.50 per kilo, right? Recently, I had to cull my stock because I'm getting too old, I had to go to the market. So I decided to sell half my, my, my herd. I got $3.30 for my, my beef cattle. So I thought to myself, oh, well, the market's obviously a lot of cattle around for sale, so I got a copper sweet. That's what the market says, that's what the market says. I then go down to my butcher. <laughs> I'm now paying much more per kilo today than I was paying three years ago when I paid much more for these cattle. So somewhere there's a big profit sitting. Now the big time, time, big time. Someone's clipping the ticket. Now, Someone's clipping the clipping ticket there. Ticket. Or multiple people so, are clipping the ticket. Let's have a look at it. I think big business is creating inflation. Consumers don't pay more. They pay whatever they charged. I think big business is creating inflation. I really do. Airlines, retailers, and we know who we're talking about. I'm not going to say any names, okay? That's one. Two, I think the, the tradesmen, to the extent we've still got a hangover of trying to fix houses up and finish houses off, we don't, government hasn't given us enough tradesmen, and as a result of that, tradesmen are so busy, they're just saying, look, look this is the price you've got to pay, you've got to, pay to get the, thing, the job done. Fair enough. I probably would do the same thing if I was in their position as well. And then finally, government threw too much money at us in the, back in the COVID period. And that last for way too long. And now we're paying the price of it. So they let us go up, and now they're letting us go down, and they're watching us on the way down. And it seems to be done with not one scintilla, not one scintilla of empathy towards us. That's what I'm getting from the other. Yeah, and, and, and Mark, I, and I get it. Like no one, no one put a gun to anyone's head in 2020 and 21 and said, take that money or we're gonna kill you. I understand we, we, we've got free will to make decisions, but Mark, you know what it's like. We've got various groups of people in our society and some of those people are more vulnerable and they make decisions and they get influenced by some people more than others. And I think oh, well, that's that is actually- well, um, We know happened. the RBA government and basically just, said no, the administration the, isn't gonna yeah, go, go in 2024. And he definitely, and, and I mean, everyone keeps saying, oh, well, he didn't tell us that they weren't gonna, he told us they weren't gonna go up to 2024. What he also didn't tell us is something else. He didn't tell us that when they're going up, they're going to go up 11 times and four of those are going to be 50 basis points. Like if he had said, listen, I don't think interest rates are going to go up to 2024, but when they go up, I'm going to put them up 11 times in a row and four of them are going to be half a percent. And if he had said that, he would have frightened the bejesus out of the whole country and the newspapers would have been all over it. People would have gone, wait a minute, let's just chill a little bit here. He said they're going to go up. Most people thought, well, go up, what do you mean? Well, maybe they're going to go up one or two times. It should be okay. But that's what he left out. <clears throat> and what we're not discussing is what he left out. Not what he said. I don't think the important thing is what he said. That is important because people heard it. But I yes. think the important thing is what he didn't say. And, and I, <clears throat> that's it. Yes, 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 yes. Mark, 
spot on because there are certain people whose influence and power means that emitting of information is far more impactful than someone else not emitting information, right? And and if 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 I can tell you, if he had just said everything that he said plus added, but by the way, beware, you should always be concerned. And if and if rates did go up, you know, this is what it would mean to your loan repayment. If he told people that your loan repayments would go up more than double, right? I think a lot of people would have re rethought it. But Mark, he's, he's the, were you surprised with today? Were you, thinking, surprised. Were you I mean, expecting I, me it? Me and uh, um, Steve Kukulis who do or, every or month, we do a, uh, an interest rate review. Uh, Steve Kukulis, the well-known economist, um, you know, ex ex Chief Economic Advisor, Julia Gillard. Um, he and I get together once a month. He comes up from Canberra and we we actually examine everything and then we put out a, out a, a prediction. And uh, Kuki and I decided on this occasion that we didn't think the RBA would go again, mainly because we thought the RBA made a mistake last last time around, one. Um, but we did predict they would go last time, but we thought they'd make a mistake by going. But two, we also took the view that surely they know that house prices or dwelling prices increasing over the last two months by, you know, one point whatever it is percent nationally is a function of supply or lack of supply. Surely they know that. They can't be using that as an asset class increase to, you know, push them into pushing interest rates up to stop us from spending way too much money. Surely they know that. I mean, it's, it, and you talk about it all the time, there's no stock. There's no stock. So prices are going to go up. There's no stock. That's what happens. That's demand and supply. That's one of the simplest. That's the first thing kids learn in economics 1A when they go to university. That's what the demand and supply curve looks like looks like and where they meet hits the x-axis and where they hit on the x-axis that's the price and if supply curve moves away in other words, which is what's happened here price is going to go up but the demand curve remains the same but even if the demand curve drops if the supply curve moves away the prices generally speaking will stay the same so um i i, I i'm totally surprised um i think he knows something else that well there is something else i want to say to me and, and he would definitely know, I assume he knows anyway. And, and Alan Kohler said it this week, and Alan Kohler is a great economist, a great commentator. Alan Kohler took the last three months inflation reads, not the last 12 months, which is 6.8, you know, from May to May, April, or May to May last year, but the last three months. And if you take the last three months inflation number for each month, add them up, divide them by three, and then you just say, let's say inflation doesn't go up or down for every month from the next nine months. In other words, three months past, nine months future. Let's say that's the case. Well, Alan Kohler's uh, uh, calculation and my calculation, Stephen Kukula's calculation, is that inflation right now has a run rate of 3.5%, not 6.8, 3.5%. Sure. If I look at inflation and I look backwards for the last 12 months, it is 6.8 or 7% because I'm looking backwards. Because I'm looking back in April last year. The last year was very high. The month of May last year was very high because interest rates hadn't even yes. just started. The increase. June was very high. July was high. August it was very high until about November. And then it started to slip away and started to fall down. But if you, if you understand the law of averages, of course inflation is going to be much higher if you look in a historic sense. He should be saying, wait a minute, I've got all the right signs now. Three months, a three month running average is showing a three and a half percent yearly rate ahead. I won't put rates down. I'm not going to put rates down. I'm not saying you should put rates down, but I'll sit back and I'll wait. And let's just see what the June number comes out. And let's, let's have a look at the mm. July number. And if there is similarly low to, you know, March, April, May, you know, beautiful. That's a box of chocolates. All good. We're we're we want it. That's what we want. It. I've got. Yeah. So, 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 Mark, you're so right. And the reason I say it is that I'm really worried that when we have our normal seasonal spring influx of listings, and then we layer that with the amount of people, and you know it because they're on your loan book, the amount of people that are coming off 
fixed to variable, which I, I got it wrong. You're the one that helped me clear it up. And then I did my own analysis. Right. There hasn't been a hell of a lot of those that happened earlier on this year. They seem to be starting to happen now. So what I'm worried, Mark, is, and I know I might be getting paranoid here, like the big short or something. I'm trying to read something that's not there. But I'm just thinking, spring influx of listings, all of a sudden you've got these fixed variable people that have made the decision, I'm not going to keep this. And I've already seen such signs of those already. And they're all on the market at the one time. And um, that, that is really concerning because right now, this demand and supply curve is, as you're saying, is basic, but that's what's actually keeping this market up. It's a very fragile market. And, and then I had a guy, I'm, I've had a week off, I'm with my daughter, and a guy where I'm at said to me, oh, mate, but, but there was a house that sold in Byron Bay for 45 million. What are you going on about about the market? I said, mate. There's one house that's sold in Byron Bay for 45 million. There's 10,000 properties in Punchbowl, Greenacre, Bankstown, mate. Let's let's look at look at those scenarios, um, Mark. It's it's a distorted. This real estate market is distorted because there's well, just well, no well, stock and, and trading. Think, Tommy, if you look at like, the volumes, and, and they are so low. You know, they'll do anything not to have to sell the property when they're under the pressure. And I think Australians have been looking, oh, well, hang on, the price, right, the prices are rising, so I'm not going to sell right now. I'll wait a bit because I can hang in there just a little bit. I mean, I've, I've sold the car, I've sold the boat, I've sold the holiday pro property, whatever. I've uh, got the best rate in the mortgage market that I can possibly get. I just got $5,000 back from one of the banks because I refinanced with them. Um, I, I mean, I'm working a little bit harder, a little bit extra. And, and look, don't worry. What we'll do is we'll hang on to this property because someone said, that maybe interest rates might start coming off late later in 2023 or sometime in 2024. All I have to do is hang in there. Now, that's okay if the Reserve Bank doesn't keep putting the rates up. And that's okay if the rates start coming off sometime towards the end of this calendar year or early in 2024. But if for some reason, and this is the new narrative now, Tom, it's not whether the Reserve Bank is going to put interest rates up the new narrative should be how long will they keep them up and when and what are they looking for in order to start to reduce them? Mm. And then, then the question becomes in your game for the property prices, how long can people hold on for? How long can they possibly hold on for? And do the two meet? Is the Reserve Bank monitoring this sort of stuff and saying, wow, we just don't want to, this is going to free fall. And of course, overriding all that or overlay all that, what about all the people coming off the fixed rates going on a variable rate? They're not affected yet. And as I tried to explain to you the other day, the, the fixed rates were given, the money, is, the money was given to the banks by the Reserve Bank of Australia from three years ago, from the 1st of March, three years ago, to 2019, on the 1st of March, the government made available money, fixed money, to the banks and the banks then just package it up and lent it out as fixed rate for a maximum of three years. So that money became due from the banks back to the Reserve Bank to be repaid by the banks back to the Reserve Bank on the 1st of March this year. And, and people's, the, so the, the, the banks can't extend beyond that, that date. Now, the money starts to roll off fixed from a consumer's point of view as and when they drew it down. So people borrowed fixed from the 1st of March 2019, uh, sorry, to 2020, I should say, Tommy, through to about January 2022. So over the next two years, all those fixed rates are going to roll into variable rate. And you write, they're going to double. And I can tell you now that 40% of all new lending from 2020, March 2022, January 2022 was fixed rate. In a normalised market, it's about 5%. Somewhere between 5 and 10%, depending on the institution. And it normally only happens in January and again in June because, you know, the fixed money becomes available. So we've got this distortion in the lending market that was put in there for the right reasons in the beginning by the Reserve Bank to stimulate lenders, to stimulate borrowers to buy property but maybe it was there for too long. I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, who knows the answer to that question? But one thing for sure, it's coming home to roost now. Well, and it will, they will, it, this is a cumulative thing. So 40% of all lending over that 
two, two year period was fixed rate. Normally it's only 5%. And they're all now rolling off into variable rates, which is double what these people borrowed at the fixed rate. There's only one scenario. People are going to start to say, hang on, we can't hold on any longer and we must sell. That's what I think is a 50, 50 chance in my, for me, 50, 50 chance of happening in the next, in the next six to nine months after which, you know, we got a problem. Yeah. Oh, 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 Mark, it would be, I don't know how it could happen, but I would love, I think, and a lot of people have been saying it in the comments, get, get low on talk to talk to Mark because Mark, you're an intelligent, you're an educated person, lecturer at university, business, law, um, uh, uh, um, run very big companies, dealt with the Packers, just to ask some simple questions because Dr. Lowe's answers are very simplistic. I mean, the other day I heard him say, oh, what are we going to do about the property problem that's going on? He says, oh, people should stay home. Uh, people should stay home longer, right? Like, mate, that's all right. That's all right if you... Mate, if, if you're living in South Yarra and you've got Butler's headquarters at the back, right? Uh, you know, and you say, go there. But, mate, you, you don't say that to someone in St. Mary's. You're going to have to stay living here with the other five people in this two-bedroom unit, right? There's just got to be a more hybrid approach. It just appears it's like one trick weapon, you know? It's like like like, like the guy, the, the well, car. The RBA guy, governor saw probably, in his defence now, and I will defend him on this one. He will probably say to you, look, Tom, it's not my job to worry about what's affordable and what's not affordable because I'm not allowed, I'm not supposed to look at any particular asset class. I'm a, my mandate is to control inflation and I've got to get it back to, and we, all of us have agreed that it's going to be two to 3%. You know, I, I question whether that's the right number, by the way, at the moment, but okay, I'll just accept that for the moment. He would say, it's not the reserve bank's job with monetary policy to assist those people. It's the government's job. It's the, you know, it's Albo's job. It's, uh, you know, Jim Chalmers job to maybe put in some other measures that help out the person at St Mary's or in those areas we're talking about. And maybe they could do it by decreasing their tax or giving them a tax rebate for a certain amount of the interest income they paid on their mortgage as a result. And, and it may have maybe means tested perhaps. Because um, I don't know if you remember, I certainly remember this. In the 80s, Frank Crean, who was Simon Crean's father, and Frank Crean was a treasurer under the Labor Party during the mid-80s, Frank Crean introduced a home loan interest rate rebate. And it was means tested because interest rates are going up at that time. And we just come out of recession. And, and it worked. A lot of people applied for these home loan rebates. And, uh, and it helped those people who were underwater, effectively. So the, the, the Reserve Bank Governor would say, yes, I empathise. I really feel sorry for everybody. I don't know whether he does or he doesn't, but he certainly says it. But he also would say, he's not even been asked, but it's not my job. My job, his job, is to reduce inflation. So I think there's an error in the mandate. I think someone should be saying, hang on, dude. Yeah, you're supposed to look after inflation. We get mm. all that. But at the same time, you're supposed to make sure you don't crush the economy. You don't crush the country. You don't put us into recession. Um, you don't crush people's hopes and dreams. You don't put people into a bind as to uh, whether or not they, they can plan not to have a kid for next year. They can't plan to have a kid next year because they, because they don't have the room, et cetera. I just think there's an error in the way the whole mandate's put together. That's what I think. And I know we just had the review of the Reserve Bank, but no one discussed this. And you know, for, for every single time they put rates up and down, but for every time they put a rate up, it has a human impact. On somebody's borrowed money, and by that's a that's a very that's a good point, Mark. Mark that's a very good point. You're, you're basically saying is maybe the position description needs to need, needs yep. to change because I know that they're an independent body, but they are appointed by the government, and in, in, he's got. To, I mean, I know they're independent, but the truth is, they report into Alba. Well, they like, choose the, 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 they, yeah, they, the government they at the time. They select who are members of the board. Yes. And uh, and I know his his um, uh, you know position is coming up for um, for it, it, it ends at the end of uh, September and is up there for review whether or not Albo and uh, Chalmers etc. Um, you know decide to reappoint him it will be another matter I guess but I th I do think it's about making them accountable in writing you know like in in their 
mandate in whatever the legislation there was that incorporated the Reserve Bank of Australia, in the mandate to more accountable to think about welfare. Now, it does say welfare in their mandate, but it talks about prosperity and welfare. But I think there should be a greater emphasis on welfare because even when they put interest rates down, it has a human impact. Because when they're putting interest rates down, if you remember, during COVID, they got down to 0.1 of a percent. That had a human impact on retirees who were living on pensions and living off their earnings, especially if they had the money in the bank, because they're earning no money. I mean, that, that mm. fact too. So, you know, like if yeah. instead of going yes. from that yes. far that side and that far that side, maybe they've got to be bringing it in a little bit more, less reductions and less increases. And let's just try and keep it in that sort of Goldilocks place. I don't know what it is, but let's keep it in a Goldilocks place. And that's not being such a big hurry to get it down to 2 to 3%. My God, it's been at, um, you know, 8, 8.5%. Eight you're not, you know, anybody would know. You're not going to get it down to two and a half, two, two, down two to three percent in a short period of time. So don't bash us to death. Let's just maybe do it over a, a nice orderly fashion over a period of two years. It doesn't have to be done before the day he retires. You make so much. You make so much sense, Mark. And I reckon the reason why is you've got this combination. Look, you, you've been, you've walked the path of the people that are walking it now. You, I, I heard you on a, on a, on a, on a, on a post on, on Instagram where you spoke about how similar this was to the early 90 periods yep. when uh, uh, you were, I think you were talking about the mortgage that you had and uh, the decisions that you had to make. You've, you've walked the path of pain and suffering. And I think that's what allows you to have this empathetic view on the various groups of people. But on the same token, You've also been involved with big business. You've got the the theory. Yeah, I, th I think you should start. I think you've got to get on a TV show again. I think you've got to. I think you've got to get that money. That money. That money show. A few people have been. One guy here, Christos, saying uh, Mark Burris for RB Governor. Trust me, mate. He's got a lot bigger. He's got a lot of big bigger things to worry about than uh, having to be crucified by everyone. And I do listen. I do. I do feel. Listen. I do feel sorry. I do feel sorry in in one regard. For, for the governor, but I'm also very mindful of it that he's getting paid a million dollars. He doesn't have his testicles on the line like a business person has, like our real estate agents have, like our mortgage brokers have, right? Um, he can make decisions. Yes, there could yeah, be a bit of hatred gonna, there. He's going to he say, can still sleep I just do my and job. Know that life's still and okay. uh, therefore, mm -hmm. I don't want the next Reserve Bank governor to be able to say that. Yeah. I want someone to say, no, your job extends into you know, the word empathy won't be used, but like extends into people's welfare and making sure you don't crush the joint in your process. And, uh, you know, the most effective um, in interest rate increase regimes where inflation has been raging, particularly I, I, I do remember well in the late 80s and early 90s, the most effective interest rate regime is when they put us into recession. They have to break something. They have to break out a will you know, and the will of the business owners to charge mm -hmm. extra money for a coffee or the will, the will of the tradie to say, look, you know, because the business starts peeling back, you know, we want to see when tradies start saying, hey, mate, can you bring the car this afternoon? I'll, I'll fix it because I really need the work. So they've got to break something. And, uh, and that usually means a recession. So, you know, when you get the recession, everyone's writing about it, everyone's talking about it. And that's what happened in the 90s. You know, Paul Keating said it, the interest rate, uh, this is the recession we had to have. They were Keating's words in 1990. He was the treasurer at the time. He then became the prime minister yeah. because he was correct. And I'd rather than the truth. We need to break something. Otherwise, yeah. Yeah. we're going to push this business, our country into recession. Get up and say, hey, guys, everybody. And maybe sit next to the treasurer and the prime minister, the three of them. Say, let's do a, a, a thing on channel ABC at 7 p.m. on Sunday night, address the nation. We just need to stop spending so much money. And vendors, please don't put your price up for a while, you know. And uh, big re I reckon, Mark, I reckon that would be a, mate, people would pay a million dollars to, to sit and watch. You with the Treasurer, the Prime Minister, RBA, simple question, facilitation of questions, because I've got to tell you, it would help so much because if they don't give us 
the real narrative. We come up with our own narratives, right? And that was one, that, one of the advantages of, you know, when we, when we were, you know, having those daily press conferences during COVID, yeah. the truth of the matter was, it was at least giving people I agree, information and I, and I, actually, on a timely manner. And at the moment, we don't have that. Suggestion. But I think the, the politicians and the public service will gain so many brownie, point, brownie points if they just sit down and explain what they're trying to do and, and maybe have, a, have it facilitated and maybe do it more than once. And it's, it, it takes a bit of courage, but I think the, the mountain they'll climb, everyone will probably say, you know what, they're probably right. And then at the same time, a bit like during COVID, ring up all the uh, big banks, ring up all the big retailers, the CEOs, and say, listen, guys, you've got to pull up and all the big petrol stations and all the big airlines. Hey, you've got to stop doing this. And then, and then go down the chain to wherever, wherever it's coming from. You've got to stop charging more money. Otherwise, we're going to put this country in recession and we're all going to suffer. What's the point? What about a bit of just like a decent conversation? Yes. Probably like a, a yes. bit of yes. conversation. Hey, guys, we've got to fix this place up. If that was your business or my business, you'd be sitting down with your CFO and your managers and all that sort of stuff as I would be and say, hey, we're going to do something new. We're going to fix this joint up. So they're running a business. They're running a country. Sit down and talk about it and, yes. and share it with your stakeholders. We're the stakeholders here. <laughs> all of us. Yes, yes. And it, when that... And I know, and I know, it, you know, we're trying to make a, a metaphor as an example, but the truth is, Australia is a company, and there is a CEO, and there's various people there, and um, and uh, uh, um, yeah, I, I, Mark, I've got to tell you, you make so much sense. My, my my twenty cents worth from the property side of you is, and I've just said this to a friend of mine. He said to me, Tom, I know that I'm going to have to sell. There's no way I can afford. He's going from four grand a month to eight five. And he just rang, me, and he just rang me up, and he says, "Listen, I can't come up with an extra grand a week, right? If it was two hundred a week, three hundred a week, but I can't come up." And the other thing is, even if I hang in there, you, you raised it earlier. How long will I have to hang in there for? How long does it mean that I'm going to go to my folks? I'm going to go to my best mate and say, "Give me thirty grand just to feed through the next three, four months." So my advice to him was, if you think you're going to sell, yeah, I would sell it now. And don't take the risk of being in the mix, you know, six months down the track when you got everyone on the market and you and you got a bit of pain and suffering. I would sell it now. And then he goes to me, Tom, do you under and he's a, he's of Greek origin. He goes, Tom, I never thought I would sell the family home. You know, it's a it's a it's a psychological thing. And I said, listen, it's difficult. But you've got to be practical and don't make decisions based on emotions, oh. mate. Be, be, be practical. It's a big thing well, for like people to sell it, whether it's ego you know, you've been, or you've it's put a big your thing, heart and soul into place. You've probably done some renovations. You've got all your stuff there. But I went through in the 90s and, you know, once I, once I made the decision, once it was sold and, you know, and we moved out, it was okay. I mean, and, and you just say, well, that was a, an era in my life. But the whole process of making the decision is quite traumatic. And, uh, and I feel for every single person who's put in that position, and it's a dreadful position to be put into having to make that decision. And that's what, that's what I'm talking sort of, sort of you and I talking about here. The Reserve Bank's putting people in that position. And I think that's unnecessary because those particular people who they are putting in that position, I can guarantee they are not the people that are creating inflation. They are, they are being punished arbitrarily and capriciously for something that's happening that they are not contributing to. That's the comment of the year. That's the comment of the year. The people There's that are someone else did not cause the inflation. You know, and uh, and it's so usually true. vendors, mate. So it's usually vendors of services and vendors of product that are creating inflation. Gas, com gas companies, electricity companies, and all these things are tied up with government policy too, by the way. It's much more complicated. There's a lot more to all this. It's a bit like the GFC. We call it the GFC. It sounds very simple, but it was much more complicated. And a lot of agendas and very various personal interests and profit profiteering were involved in why the GFC happened. And it took many years to unfold. And I think globally, and as well as here in Australia, I think that 
this whole period and the inflation and the interest rate increases is because it's happening in America even at a greater clip, much greater clip. Um, I think at some stage we'll be watching this on Netflix. This will be a thing. I'm, I mean, this is not just because this is not one of your normal high uh, interest rate change periods. Normally in Australia, our interest rate change periods are six up or six down. And they do one, they don't do one a month, they do one every couple of months. And over a period of 18 months or 12, you know, you see a nice gentle curve and a nice gentle curve up or down, whichever way it is going up or down. We didn't have interest rate increases since 2010. And uh, it, I think it's yeah, 2010, somewhere around there. And so we hadn't had interest rate increases for uh, 12 years. That in itself tells me that the Reserve Bank, maybe that when they said, oh, we're not going to put rates up to 224, maybe they could have said, look, by the way, we haven't had interest rates increases since 2010. And that's 12 years ago. And by the way, our current official interest rate is 0.1 of a percent, which is by any measure extraordinarily low. So when we do put them up, we're probably going to have to put them up quite a lot. And so someone might have said, well, Mr. Reserve Bank, how much? And he might have said 10, 11 times, because I'd like to get it up around the inflation number, around 3%, 2 to 3%, the inflation number I want. That's the number we want. We want our official rate to be close, which has always been close to the um, uh, inflation number. So if he had have said that, someone would have gone, oh, hang on, that's... Uh, that's at least eight or nine increases. People might have gone, whoa, I can't afford eight or nine increases. Let's hold back. Let's stop spending. That's what could have happened. And I don't for one second accept that they didn't know that. They know more about this stuff than mate, you and I do. They, they, you know, I know a bit about it, but they know it to the nth degree. They got 500 economists sitting there. They're all, you know, PA. PhDs and some of that in econometrics and economics. Economics, they know their stuff. Why this wasn't told to us, and as you said earlier, it's what he didn't say that is probably created this sort of bubble of people thinking, mm -hmm. "Ah, we're never going to be a problem. Borrow as much as you can. Buy, 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 keep spending money. Interest rates are really low. Let's take that really low fixed rate of two point not uh, one point nine nine. <laughs> I've never seen a one point nine nine fixed rate in my life, Tony." In, in 67, mate, never seen a fixed rate at that rate, ever. No. That can't last. I mean, no. So, so, Mark, you said something before, and I just, before I went on leave, I did a conference, and the CEO said to me, oh, he goes, it'd be good if you were there first thing in the morning so you can see where, where I'm doing my roundup and summary of the year. And that way you can sort of, when you're doing your presentation, have that in your mind. So I went along, you know, and I got there a bit earlier, which pissed me off because he spoke from nine till 10 and I wasn't on till 1.30, but he's, he's the boss, he was paying the bills. And I sat there and they had the, they had it, they'd gone up 23% year on year, 23% year on year, incredible. And then, but the interesting thing was the brief was how the people would deliver to their customers the news that rates were gonna go up. And he said to me, the narrative's got to be, when they're delivering it, is that our costs have gone up, inflation. And I'm thinking to myself, on the one hand, they've just cracked 25% growth in profits year on year. And on the other hand, we've got to put them up totally. because of and, inflation. And, and, and by the way, that expensive. doesn't make sense. There's what someone said, making money, Mark. What you said makes sense, but what they said doesn't make sense. If they're making such big profits, then the cost, the cost of the inputs can't have gone up by that much. Otherwise, whilst the revenue number might have gone up, the cost would have followed it. So the profits wouldn't have gone up. You, you know what I mean? If the cost of inputs had gone up as well. So somewhere there's a mismatch between the cost of inputs and the repricing of the product. And that's called profit. And no, I think, I, I, think it was, I think, I think that was just a start. I think that was a sales yeah. line to try and, you know, hopefully get another 25% next year, right? That's what I think, that's, that's what I think, um, that's what I think it was, Mark, you make so much absolute sense. Um, and I think uh, your, your people at Yellow Brick Road are so, so lucky to have you because you're able to communicate and these mortgage brokers that you've got, these mortgage brokers you've got, it's a two way relationship because you're getting fit, fed input from the conversations that they're having with their existing clients 
and their perspective we, we get a lot and that shapes of, your own view on input what's input really in. happening and out. you know funnily enough mm -hmm. we ran a, uh, a pro we ran a competition we offered uh five prizes of twelve thousand dollars each and we got something like 1300 applications from people who whose um, interest rate had gone up by a thousand dollars a month so we, that's what twelve thousand bucks a year which is what we offered five people twelve thousand dollars just as a as a prize as a gift and um and why we did it because we actually wanted to gather um inputs from as many people as possible to enter into the competition to tell us you know what they're experiencing we wanted to get the narrative from these people and we then compiled all that tommy into a report and we called it the human impact study it was a study and we sent it on to the reserve bank governor we delivered it to him and he sent us an email back saying, thanks very much. I'm going to share this with my colleagues. And that's the only thing I've ever heard, of him, heard from him. And by the way, he still put interest rates up. <laughs> so it didn't work. And it cost me 60 grand. But it doesn't matter. I, as you say, I've got to find out firsthand from people in their stories. They did it by video or by text, in narrative, um, and to see what pain there is. And this is across Australia, not so much in West Australia, and not so much, so much in Adelaide. Mostly the eastern states, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, and all the big geographical areas across the eastern states. And as I talk, we got 1,200 people. And I probably got personal emails, maybe from two or 300 people. And uh, it got to the point I just couldn't answer them all. So we had to set up a whole division of people here who go around answering these emails on my behalf because we don't want to leave people put, putting a, a message out and just being left sitting there doing nothing. So. They just wanted to tell you the story. People just want someone to listen. They, they want to tell you the story. And, mm. and a lot, most times we couldn't help. You know, 99 out of 100, we couldn't do anything about it. But at least they, they, they showed some gratitude that we were able, they were able to express their story, tell us how they're feeling, tell someone. Someone cared. And that's my whole point. I mean, who's, apart from you and me and a lot of other, you know, real estate agents and mortgage brokers, we care, but... Who are they looking out there to who actually gives a damn about what's going on? Like who in government actually cares? I haven't seen any stand up and say, you know, we, uh, this is terrible. This is not mm. what we want. Just hang in there. We're going to fix this. Uh, I, why can't someone, why can't, why, why don't they give a damn? Mm. I don't know. Uh, uh, what are they more interested in than what's more? Because it is, it is hard, Mark, the truth is, it is hard. I remember one, one CEO in a, in a business that I was involved in, he, he, he made a strategy and the strategy was that it was going to look great on that spreadsheet for the next 12 months. It was going to look good. But I said to him, I said, do you understand the impact that it's going to cause subsequently? Like, you know, like quantitatively, it looks good for this year, but qualitatively, and he just said, listen, that's a, that's a bigger problem for others to sort out this is my job that's what i care about right and i think sometimes it is like that people say this is my job i like it like dr Lowe said i heard him say it last time he was being grilled by it was being grilled hard by by a journo on on i don't know uh, abc it might actually, anyway he just turned around and he just said i'm not resigning i've got a seven-year contract and i'm staying in my job he, he he could have just he could have just said it in a in a yeah, nicer well, way but he's we, basically saying that's the deal you know, it's just no too much approach. i think they have too much input into how we live our lives you know like we never get a chance to vote for them uh, and you know like and you know they're on big wickets and i for me i just think not only should there be more transparency from them um there should be more empathy from them as well but i also think that we should have some there should be some way we can have an input as to how they behave and of course what's going to happen someone's going to say well go and see a local member yeah but my, my local members doesn't have any my legal local members are teal when she's not going to be able to influence any outcomes with dr low um no way um she might be interested in doing that but and she might be prepared to do that but she's not going to have any influence over that you know and you know this is australia and one of you know i think what's becoming bluntly obvious is one of the flaws in our system is that we don't have any input into how powerful unelected officials impact our lives. And it's not just in mortgages and stuff. It's, there's a lot of other things that are becoming glaringly obvious over the past mm. few years. COVID's a great example. Um, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, COVID didn't exist. I'm not trying to create any conspiracy theories at all. 
But at the same time, there were unelected officials making decisions about our freedoms. And, and I, I, I kept wondering to myself, well, these are people who are telling me that I can't go somewhere, I've got to stay home when I'm not sick. And, uh, um, and I'm not going somewhere where I'm going to be exposed to anybody. I'm just going to get in my car and drive to my office and sit in my office and lock my door and do my work. Um, and at the risk of being arrested, perhaps, and particularly in a place like Victoria. And I just think there's a, these things need to be revisited. That's what I think. And it's not just around interest rates and people not showing any empathy and not really looking as though they don't care. He may well care, but he doesn't look like he cares. And that's, you know, it's like, you've got kids. At the end of the day, mate, the kids, you can't say to kids, oh, look, I care, and don't look like you care. I mean, kids are interested, not what you say, but how you are, what you do. Well, we're all still kids. We're all still, you and I are little boys still at heart, and all the women are little girls still at heart, and we all want to know that someone gives a damn. And we're all looking for who that individual is. And it's not up to you and me, Tommy, but, you know, unfortunately we're taking on because, you know, we're just, that's an interesting topic for us, you know, and it's in our territory. But, you know, I just wish some of our elected officials would take that up, and I also wish some of our unelected officials would start to feel the feel the need to be a little bit more, a little bit more caring. Yeah, a guy just put a quote there, as Mark says, success is the family you raise. There's great comments coming through here. Mark, one final uh, question to you is, and I know that it might be, you know, too early because it's, this is well, we don't know if coming today. Really depend what the is data there more? Says, but I think more if you, come? at the end of, so at the end of, July, uh, so it, sort of on the 24th or 25th of July, we'll get the 12 month official CPI number for the previous 12 months. Um, and I think that I, I would say the August meeting will be very important. The one or second, one or two August meeting will be the second, will be a very important meeting. He did say in his, and, and it will depend on the data, but he did say in his last paragraph if the data suggests that he has to put interest rates, he said this today, put the rates up, he will continue to put rates up. They might remain resolute in getting ourselves, getting us to the two to three percent band in inflation. I, I think it'd be a, a pretty ballsy move to go again in June, uh, July, uh, one July. But if the annual CPI number that the AB, the Australian Bureau of Statistics prints at the end of July for the preceding twelve month fiscal year is too high, in other words, you know, above six percent. My gut feeling is he might jam another another one into us in um, in August, and that will be that will be the recession we had to have for sure. Yep. Yeah. Back to Paul Keating's quote, Mark Burris. Thank you so much. You're an absolute legend, mate. The re I can tell you, the real estate community. You've become a, a voice for the real estate community as well. And the reason why is the real estate community is fundamentally built on small businesses and people who wake up on the first day every month saying, list properties, make sales, or you won't eat and your staff won't eat. This is how the business it's community of real estate works. You know what, Tommy, and so it's no different to mortgage brokers, actually. And it's thanks pretty for inviting much me on the identical and setup. I really appreciate it. And thanks for taking the time out of your holiday to actually address your, your audience. I want to say one thing about what well, you, you just mentioned, Paul Kenny. I mentioned him earlier. He, he's probably a good example of what I call empathy coming from a politician. Now, Paul upset a lot of people. He had he had this very um, uh, acute tongue in terms of his, you know, the way he spoke. But Keating got it, and Hawke got it too, and and Howard got it too. They were the first to always get up and sort of talk us through with truth. Keating said, this is a recession we had to have. He didn't need to say that. And in mm -hmm. fact, that I think that ended up losing him the prime minister election in the 95 or 96 election, whichever one it was when he was prime minister, he lost. Because he's too truthful, because the media just jumped all over him. Oh, he said, this is a recession we had to have. And I think, but those politicians really are, are shining lights to me. Keating, Hawke, Howard, Fraser, um, and, 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 and even Howard as treasurer, they explain things to us. Costello, they explain things to us. Hockey even, they explain stuff to us and they, 
And I felt as though I was being properly guided. And I'm not here to have a, a go at Jim. I'm not having a go at Jim Chalmers at all. But he also knows how brutal the media are. Media are much more brutal today than they've ever been in the past. And you're on a short fuse all the time. You know, it just takes a quick light and the bomb goes off and you're in trouble. But for me, I want to see, I would like to see, and I think most Australians would like to see, just much more empathetic and much more emotion. And you know, the hockey went, I remember he told everybody after we won the America's Cup, everyone should have holiday tomorrow. I mean, that sort of stuff. I mean, that's that's sort of us. That's our culture. That's what Aussie, that's what we're like. You mentioned, you mentioned, Mark, you mentioned Howard. Last Friday, I was coming back, I was on the far north coast and I flew back in from, from the Gold Coast uh, on a Virgin flight. And there, uh, there I was, I see John Howard, right? And this is the fascinating thing. He's in a line and he's, he, he didn't take the fast track line. And I presume it's probably because maybe he's a Qantas flyer and he didn't, and he, I don't know what the story was, but he was, he was at the back. And there's a guy with a suit. I can't get over it because he ended up sitting next to me. Goes over to the Virgin Girls. At, it was gate 17. Goes over and says to these girls, he goes, do you realise one of the most important people in Australia is queued up at the back there trying to get on the plane, right? Anyway, and I heard him say it. Next thing he knows, this guy with the suit sat down with me. And I said, mate, that was... That was good what you've done. And I said, did they fast track him? He goes, I'm not sure. He goes, I just got on the plane then. And he said to me, he goes, mate, John Howard was one of the few people that cared about the people of Australia as much as he cared about himself. He goes, don't get me wrong. He's a politician, right? And he was on a salary and he's got his own career, but he cared about people. And you brought another couple there that you brought in, Howard oh, okay. and, and that, Fraser. That, there was that, one, that one big more you mentioned too, the, Howard, Fra the Fraser Hall. I mean... We, no. we might not have gone for a Labor politician or a Liberal politician, but that's a, there's a common denominator between all of those people that I just mentioned. They wore their heart on the sleeve. They're very empathetic. They under, understood Australia. They understood our culture. And they talked. Well, yep. I've, I've just worked it out, Mark. You, you, were, you were his neighbour. He was up in Benston. Yeah, Peter. Uh, uh, and Keating went to my school. Um, I'm looking at Howard. Can every boy's high? Um, uh, for a long, long time. So he was always a, you know, a Labor type guy, you know, union style guy, Labor type guy. He, 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 look, whether he's my politics or not, it doesn't matter. But he did wear his heart in his sleeve. He was empathetic. He did explain things. He was honest in his opinions. Not always what we wanted to hear, but at the same time, he's honest in opinions. I'm not suggesting the current guys are dishonest, but they are guarded because of the way media operates today. And the media is so broad and so brutal that they're very, very careful. Hey, Tommy. All righty. Mark Burris, thank you so much. Always an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Signing off. Thank you for everyone. We had a thousand viewers uh, uh, right at the start oh, of this. It's very good. Good stuff, Tommy. Enjoy. Caring about what's happening at the moment. Oh, you know?